history isn't just something that happened to the great and the good. Much of who we are and where we come from is down to a whole host of ordinary people getting their hands dirty, doing a lot of really terrible jobs. In this program... The cleaning job that kept Britain on the rails. <coughs> why you need dog poo to make a saddle. I don't think I would like to do this every day. And what on earth was I yeah. thinking of when I said yes to this? <laughs> Welcome to the worst jobs in the Victorian period. Victoria died over a hundred years ago, but it doesn't seem that long. And that's partly because the Victorian workers laid the groundwork for a lot of the things we take for granted. Many of us still live in their houses and use the schools and hospitals and other public buildings that they put up. And they built the railways. The Victorian era was the golden age of steam, powered by a lot of really terrible tasks. In Queen Victoria's lifetime, the railways grew from 100 miles of track to 22,000 miles. The railways that transformed the country and industry were built by a massive army of workers. Rail was cutting edge and rail was romantic, but that's only thanks to a labour force willing to do the most unromantic jobs. Every little boy wants to be an engine driver, but on the footplate there was a hierarchy. The driver was top dog. Beneath him was the back-breaking job of fireman, feeding the fire for hours on end. Not many kids wanted to do this. And I can't imagine anyone dreaming of the job below the fireman. The very worst job on the railway was the engine cleaner. But that didn't mean just a tiny bit of spit and polish. This was a job for which you had to get really kitted up. This one's pretty cold, isn't it? Yeah, well, well I can only show you what on the cold one because uh, what you're going to have to do now, Tony, is actually get inside the firebox. Uh, get in that? Get in there, yeah. Off you go. <laughs> right, hands on here. Hands on there. Feet in. Feet in here. Yeah, put, put your, get your thighs in the hole <laughs> and then turn yourself over in the hole. <laughs> your, your hands are now touching the floor. <laughs> yeah. And then just ease I yourself can't in. can't turn round. Yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. You all right? Ugh. Right in. Oh! You put, should touch touch the fire bars with your feet. Yeah, I'm feeling. Okay, you're in. Yeah, I got it. I can't get them. There we go. There we go. Now I'll pass in the, the shovel now. Yeah. I can't see a thing. <laughs> you have to feel your way round. Yeah. There's your shovel. You know what I've realised? If you're going from London to I don't know, Glasgow, you'd be shifting tons and tons of this stuff. Oh, yeah, you, you shovel about five or six tons of coal. You don't have to be fit, you know. Cool, blimey. <laughs> you can't get all that much on it, can you? Because otherwise it just all tips back on you. No, it's right, it's very awkward. Right, though, they've got nice clean fire bars now, light the fire on. I'll tell you what, that is one really disgusting job. Enjoyed that, didn't you? Oh, <laughs> Well, you've got to do a reverse of what you did to get in. You've got, to, to, you've got to turn round and grab that oil tray. Or just crawl out. <laughs> Enjoy that, are you? What's next? Show you. After being in this hole, I was happy to get a breath of fresh air, but not for long. I should have known better and stayed inside. So we're going right under one of these locomotives? We're going right under now to clean out the ash pan. Oh, and, it's pretty uh, messy down here, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's a very wet and oily and uh, nasty, dirty. Would well, the lads have been down here all day? Yeah, that, so there would have been people on a shift system in a big depot, and that would be your job all day long, disposing the engines, which would consist of digging out the fire like we've just done, Yeah. and doing the ash pan like I'm going to show you now. Uh, you know, as rotten jobs go, it must uh, really qualify for one of the one of the worst, if not the worst. It could be pouring with rain, or it could be freezing cold. Very likely, 
in the middle of the night and this is all you do all day and uh, the tool I've got in my hand is the ash pan rake yeah so what you have to do is to put your ash pan rake right inside here and uh, and pull it's very dusty oh. Oh, this is an empty one, by the way. <laughs> as far as cleaning jobs go, this really has got to be just about the worst. <laughs> oh. It's all in your mouth. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Long before all this lot, though, long before anyone could even dream of getting a good job like this, someone had to lay these. And that end of the business really was hard work. Road building is a huge, expensive, vastly complicated undertaking. Nowadays, they've got machinery to do all the heavy lifting, Vans to sit in if it tips down, even toilets for God's sake. In Victorian times, they had to do it all by hand. These men did the hard work. Navvies, so called because they built the navigation canals. They were a wandering army of itinerant labourers. A quarter of a million of them built the backbone of Victorian Britain. The roads, the canals, docks and sewers. And they built the railways. They lived in shanty towns on the job, on a ration of beer and meat. Two pounds of meat and a gallon of beer a day. After work, they drank some more. And their job was to dig. So you think digging's easy? What about something like this? It's the size of your average back garden and about four metres deep. Imagine digging this by hand. Where on earth would you start? Actually, you start somewhere like this. Originally, this land would have been flat right across the top there like that. And this whole V-shape would have been filled up with earth and covered in little bushes and trees, rather like it is now. And then the navvies would have arrived and they'd have started digging down and down and down until finally they got to the level where the track had been dug to further down the line. And all they'd got to do that with was a shovel and a pick and a wheelbarrow and a couple of wooden planks. And if Rob's our 19th century navvy, how would he get all this earth from here right up to the top of the cart? He would run it up the plank, do a barrow run. You've got two ropes there. One would be attached to Rob, the other would be attached to the barrow. And at the top there, you'd have a horse in those days, a well-trained horse to the job. How much of this stuff would they have had to shift in a day? Oh, believe it or not, 20 tonnes. Because they were being uh, paid piecework, I mean, that's how they knew that they were moving 20 tonnes. 20 tonnes. How much do you reckon you've got in there, Rob? One and a half hundred weight. Do you reckon you could get that to the top? Yeah, probably. Go on, Ed. He wasn't actually pushing the barrow, of course. There was a horse at the top that was taking the strain. He was steering it. Uh, but you've got to think about the slipperiness of the oh, okay. wet uh, plank and all that sort of business. Very, been very incredibly difficult. Incredibly dangerous. Very dangerous indeed. Very dangerous. If the horse took fright or suddenly refused to do what it was supposed to do, and the barrow would lose momentum, suddenly, you know, probably the barrow would go one side and the man would go the other. That was one of the many dangers attached to uh, making a cutting. It was said that every mile of track claimed a life. That was the price that was paid? That was the price that was paid. Life was cheap. Yeah. <laughs> Shall I go? Yeah. <laughs> Can you bring it back down? Yeah. Let me hold my coat. The irony was that because the barrow run was so dangerous, the bosses put in new machines to do the same job, but the guys hated them because they were on piece rate and so they could earn much more money, cheers Rob, from doing it with the barrow. So they smashed the machines up and reverted to doing it this way. Okay. Yeah, I'll fill it then. I've got to fill it first. Yeah. 
I thought you were going to do that. I do, me. I have to lean right back, presumably, otherwise my feet will slip when I get to the duckboard. I might line up all right. Yeah. Whoa! It feels as though it's, not, it's all going to tip back onto me. Of course, the extraordinary thing is, if I'd been doing this in Victorian times, I'd have been full of beer and meat. Oh, my legs come off the duckboard. Oops. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Keep going. Yes! Done it! Done it! It's really satisfying. <laughs> satisfying, yes, but also terrifying. I thought the whole time that the barrow was just oh, going to collapse on top of me. It was pretty heavy going. Of course, if I was a Victorian navvy, I'd have had to have done about 200 of these every day. <laughs> Pissed. OK, so the tracks are down, the job's done. Well, no, actually. Navi's queued up for the barrow run. No one wanted to pack the ballast. What's the ballast actually for? You use your ballast to get uh, good drainage on your track. Yeah. So your sleepers don't fill up the water. And obviously, the more ballast you've got, the more stable the track is. Obviously, when you drive a train over it, the track tends to move around. And uh, if you've not got much ballast, then you end up with an even track eventually. It's not a very uh, difficult job, is it? By the time you've done, you're going to end up with it level between sleepers. Yeah. And you'll have shoveled a ton and a half of ballast. Right. Have a go. My little pile here is just a mingy half a ton. This pile is 20 tons. Each navvy would have had to shift this every day. Digging it was a doddle, really, but packing it... You've got to get it underneath the sleeper. You've got to pack it under as hard as you can, really. And then once you've filled void, that one's fairly stable. That's really hard work, isn't it, that thing? <laughs> After only ten minutes of this, I'd had enough. I was going to say something like presenters are supposed to, but my mind's gone numb. I've only done half a sleeper. <sighs> but however much your muscles screamed, the worst job of all on the railways was the one that took the most lives. The worst job was having to dig out tunnels. This tunnel is about half a mile long. It took hundreds of men to dig a tunnel like this. They worked in candlelight. Twelve-hour days were the norm. Accidents were common. A combination of naked flames and dynamite was often lethal. There was one particular explosion on the Manchester to Sheffield um, stretch, and uh, 50 men were killed and 500 injured. So what happened if someone was injured? What happened was, as like as not, you'd be carted to the mouth of the tunnel and uh, put on an ordinary wagon with straw and just jolted along for probably three miles to the nearest road before ever you got anywhere near a hospital such as they were in those days. It was an unimaginable torture for the injured man just to be taken to the nearest hospital. In 1840, in the Woodhead Tunnel in Cheshire, 32 men were killed, 140 seriously injured, two had fractured skulls, and 500 others suffered broken bones. It's hard to imagine, isn't it, what an explosion would have been like in a tunnel like this? I don't think we can imagine it, Tony. Well, we can't imagine it, but we can recreate it. We can't do the, the panic and the terror and the feeling of isolation, but we can recreate the explosion, although this being the 21st century, we've got a special effects man way over there and we've got a, a second camera and loads of lighting. We've got ear defenders, fire extinguishers, electrician, the police have been informed. We've got the man from the Parks Authority keeping an eye on us all. In fact, 
We've got all the paraphernalia of a 21st century risk assessment form. Go! <laughs> it is pretty <laughs> terrifying, isn't it? <laughs> it's brilliant. I could feel it. I could feel it. You actually get the shake as much mm, as the noise, yeah. don't you? That's what I meant. I felt it. Tremendous. A jolly good bang, though, you've got to admit. <laughs> <laughs> The railways built by the navvies transformed the country and gave the Victorians a new freedom to travel. For the first time, large numbers of people were able to move around very easily. In the 1870s, 92,000 farm workers left the countryside and moved to towns in search of work. Life out in the country was becoming more and more difficult as agriculture staggered from one depression to another. For those farmers left behind, work got tougher and money was tight. Which meant that the worst jobs in the countryside were left for those who came cheapest, mostly kids. Why were so many of the worst jobs in the countryside done by children? Well, quite frankly, there was a lot of them. Large Victorian families and, of course, a readily available, cheap form of labour. What kind of jobs would they have done? Well, they'd have done any job, really, from any fetching, carrying, menial jobs, fetching water for pigs, wood for the fire, anything like that. What are these two doing? These are actually scaring crows, and there's an old adage, one for the rook, one for the crow, one to rot and one to grow. What does that mean? Well, it means that you sow enough seed that you're going to get a crop, and the one that is growing, you want to do your best to keep the birds off that. So by having your kids running around, keeping the birds away, you're hopefully going to have enough to harvest in the summer. So they don't have to get rid of every one, uh, as long as there's enough seeds and seedlings available to let the field flourish. That's, that's right, fine. yeah, keep, keep the uh, majority there and keep the birds off. Well, this looks like a worse job for me. What's this? Well, yes, this is dibbing, or dibbling. So we're going to take these divers, yeah. put them in the ground. Why? So, making little dents, yeah. and then you can sow the seeds in that little basket there. Put a few in each What, like hole. sort of nine or ten? That'll do. Yeah. And we'll just keep going like that. Yeah. Until we sow nice, even rows. Oh, your back would go quickly doing too much of this, wouldn't it? It certainly would. Who would have done it? Well, it would have been small holders, small little family farms, because uh, this is a very cheap form of uh, equipment, rather than expensive uh, horse-drawn machinery, and because uh, uh, the whole family could get involved, children, wives, everyone, uh, helping out sowing this crop. So it's nice, even space apart, so you can get through when it's growing and actually hoe it and keep the weeds down. Which is the dibbler, you or me? Me. <laughs> Do you have a dibble? I think so. Thank you. Oh, I like being the dibbler. You've got the easy job. Yeah, right? it's better than sticking the seed in, isn't it? There's definitely a hierarchy in this job, isn't there? Definitely, like your top dibber. Yeah. Well, I can go a bit quicker now, can I? Getting the routine going now, yeah. rhythm going now. It's just a little bit monotonous, isn't it? My arms are starting to ache now. My back is. <laughs> if you've ever complained about your job being boring, forget it. You have no idea. Try this one. at work here. I know it doesn't look like it, but I am a herring caller. My job is to sit here and watch, and when I see a flock of gulls flying low over the water, I know that there's a shoal of herring out there, so I shout out the word herring to the villagers, and they rush out of their houses and jump in their boats and go and catch them. But it can take quite a while. What are they collecting? 
Well, they're actually collecting the stones off the field. The crop's been sown, it's winter wheat, so it stands about two or three inches above the actual stone now. And uh, there's one thing with this land, it, it almost grows stone. They're actually getting them out off the soil to hopefully improve the soil and actually get the stones out of the way of the harvesting machines with moving blades, which are expensive machines. And uh, so we're using a cheap form of labour here to actually get this potential hazard out of the way. And what happens to the stones? Well, they'll go off into the cart and we can utilise those for making trackways and uh, or pathways just around and about and maybe even use them on the, on the parish roads. What was life like for these kids? Well, it wouldn't have been all nice and sunny like today. It would have been cold, hard, real drudgery. They'd have been out here all weathers, picking away. And of course, I've got gloves and they don't have the luxury of that. Pretty tough, grim conditions. And of course, at the end of the day, after a long 10, 12 hours work, getting home to a small, damp, crowded little house, large families, not much to eat, probably just a little bit of bread and cheese. So all in all, pretty grim. Life was really very tough for Victorian children. Victorian kids were skinny and undernourished. Many were beaten, and they were drugged to ease their pain so that they could work even longer hours. When Parliament outlawed the use of child labour in 1869, no one really seemed to take any notice. Herring calling was a bit like watching paint dry without the thrill. People in Victorian Britain did what they could to earn a living. No job was too small. And taking money from fishermen to alert them to the chance of a catch was one way of earning something. Oh, and it was a bit cold on the bum. Jobs like these may have been boring or messy or just plain hard, but they were nothing like facing one of mankind's creepiest and oldest enemies, the rat. Welcome to the grim world of the Victorian rat catcher. Rats were rampant in Victorian times. In overcrowded towns, washing and toilet facilities were very poor. Disease was rife, filth was commonplace. In one single building in London, a rat catcher caught 700 rats. Everyone needed a rat catcher, and this was the most famous of them, Jack Black. Rat catcher to Queen Victoria. Rat catching was a big business. There was money to be made. The rats were very saleable. Um, he could uh, catch rats and sell them to publicans who were running um, rat uh, pits in their pubs, a secret illegal occupation. What was a rat pit? A rat pit is where they pitched the rats against dogs, probably terriers, and they had a fight and people betted on them. That can't have been much of a market, can it? Well, one publican in Enfield was buying 500 rats a week. That's 26,000 a year at threepence a head, so you can work it out for yourself. Presumably they had rat poison in those days, though. Yes, rat catchers used to make their own poisons. Secret recipe is an example. Now, a rat um, catcher would go to a marketplace uh, with his poison to sell to the general public because rats were such a problem then as they are now. And he might have a cage with many, many rats in, and to demonstrate the efficacy of his poison, he'd take a live rat out of his cage, give it the poison, and <laughs> there you go. Killing rats using poison was easy. What made this one of the worst jobs of the age was when they had to catch them live. They did it by hand. Rat catchers attracted the rats by rubbing a mixture of sweet-smelling oils on their hands. This worked, but rats bite. A lot. Rat catchers often caught terrible infections. You'd need to be an idiot to put your hand blindly in a hole after a rat, wouldn't you? Smell like an old-fashioned boiled sweet. I think those rats are going to love that. The problem is, half the time, you don't know whether you can hear something rustling or whether it's just... You leaning on the... You hear that? That is, that, that is definitely something live. It seemed like a good idea at the time, but quite honestly, when you just stick your defenceless hand in here and you've no idea, I don't think there's anything here, what's going to be on the other end? It is a little bit scary. There's been no noise in here at all for the last two or three minutes. That's my hand, not, not a rat. Oh, I've got something. I've got something furry, definitely. And it's wiggling, it's horrible. <laughs> I don't know, 
actually didn't want to hurt it, but I suppose that wasn't really the issue for... Oh, there it is. There it is. Oh! I thought it was going to bite me there. So what do you think now, Tony? Well, it's kind of cute, isn't it? But uh, it's also fairly disgusting. I don't think I would like to do this every day. Shall I take it? Yeah. Herring! 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 I think they're all asleep. An anchovy! After all that hard herring calling, I thought I deserved a trip to the pub. But for some Victorian workers, that didn't mean a relaxing drink. Top of virtually everyone's list of worst jobs of the Victorian era has got to be child chimney sweep. But according to Dick Van Dyke, a sweep is as lucky as lucky can be. Was it really such a bad job? Sending little boys up chimneys was actually made illegal in 1840. 24 years later, the act had to be strengthened because people just ignored it. Leslie, did they really put little children as young as Daniel up the chimney? I'm afraid they did. Children even younger than Daniel. I know that Daniel's eight and children of six and seven were sent up the chimneys. Why? Why didn't they just shove big brushes up? And there were lots of very poor children around who'd got stunted growth from bad nutrition and they were very, very slim and they were very, very agile and could handle a little brush like that superbly for sweeping down the soot. Right, you scruffy little urchin, get out that chimney. Leslie, how much did they pay these kids? Well, they didn't pay them anything at all, actually. Um, kids of about six and seven, often orphans or kids looked after by the parish, they'd apprentice them to a master sweep. And the idea was the master suite would care for them, feed them, clothe them, give them a living, until such time as they were too big to go up the chimney. The only problem is, of course, the master sweeps were out to make as much money as they could themselves. So the kids didn't get paid. They get very meagre food. Um, often that meant that they got stunted growth. They were very slim. Daniel? Yeah? You all right in there? You're not stuck, are you? Just a little bit. What are you doing? I'm cleaning. What was it like up there in the chimney? Very tight fitting. I mean, often on a chimney like this, um, you'd have your main chimney, but you'd have flues going off from the main chimney. So very, very narrow areas that they had to climb in. Suppose you were in there for about three hours and there was loads of chimney soot and stuff. I would cough a lot and get squashed by the space because you're in this tight space. Kids did get stuck, kids died of respiratory problems and sometimes they got stuck in there and nobody could get them out. So it was a very tragic life. Do you want to come out? Yeah. All right, finish your cleaning, then you can come. OK. As industry grew in the Victorian period, mass production broke jobs down into individual tasks that were unbelievably repetitive and dull. Label sticking was the Mount Everest of dull. This was as good as it got for a lot of people. There was nowhere else to go. This is a very boring job. But ironically, one of the great men of the age started off here. Charles Dickens was a label sticker as a lad, before going on to write the novels which give us our clearest pictures of the age.
We know a lot about the Victorians because in their curiosity to explore life, they documented almost everything. Even something like this. I am a cigar end collector. And why? Because I can sell them back to the cigar manufacturers or onto people who want to smoke but can't afford to buy full cigars. We know of people who did jobs like this from Henry Mayhew, who documented the poor of London. And some of the worst jobs he found were jobs involving scavenging. Why was there so much scavenging in Victorian times? Well, of course, there'd always been people scavenging on, on the streets. But what happened during the Victorian period was that England was becoming more and more urbanised, more and more people were moving into the towns and the cities, and they were producing a lot more rubbish and a lot more refuse. And plus, there were just more and more people who needed to find some form of employment and some way to feed themselves. This guy with the tall hat over here, what's he scavenging? Are these ham bones, chicken bones? Well, these are all sorts of bones that this bone grubber has picked up outside houses and just in the streets of London. And they were a very valuable commodity because he could sell them on to bone mills and they would be ground up and they could be used for manure and to produce soap and, and other products. Poor, oh, some of those don't smell very fresh, do they? <laughs> What about this burly looking guy? He looks just like the Coleman we used to have when I was a kid. Well, he's actually a, a dustman, so he's going around households emptying dustbins and collecting the, the dust and cinders there. And that's what we've got here, just dust. That's right. Um, most of the rubbish that Victorian households were producing was um, the dust and cinder from fires. Um, and this dust would be taken by pony and cart to some of the enormous dust yards around the city and the dust there would be sifted and sorted. Some of it would go for manure, some of it for making bricks. And there would be a lot of other very um, useful and valuable things mixed in with the dust. So there would be things like old boots and shoes, um, jewellery, um, rags and bones, all kinds of things that actually had a sell-on value. This is a rather sinister looking guy. What about this? What's that for? Well, this man is a, a tosher or a sewer hunter, so he made his living going down London's ramshackle sewers, finding coins, jewellery, silver-plated cutlery, and he would use this hoe to poke around in the old brickwork. But also, if he fell into difficulty, if he got stuck in a quagmire, he could use this hoe to try and lift himself out before he, he sunk without a trace. Are these the Premier League of scavengers? These were very much the elite of scavengers because they could make as much as two pounds a week from the, the items that they found down in the sewers. And they had to be very fit, very strong, very healthy because they faced a lot of dangers down in the sewers from attacks from rats, from the, the poisonous fumes that were down in the sewers. Rummaging around in bins like these guys, collecting dust and even bits of bone, were pretty horrible jobs, but they weren't the worst. The worst scavenging job was down here on the shore. This place had 50 people a day working here. The name sounds charming, but the job of mudlark certainly wasn't. In Victorian times, this was a grim place to be. It would have been incredibly smelly. Um, the River Thames was basically like a, an open sewer. Um, the majority of London's population, uh, their sewage just went straight into the river, untreated. Um, there were lots of other things that were going into the river as well. Um, things like offal from the city's slaughterhouses, uh, vegetable waste from the wholesale markets, uh, even things like dead dogs, dead cats, even dead bodies from murdered people who'd been tossed into the river. So who were the people who were poking around here looking for stuff? Well, these were the mudlarks. They were really the most wretched of people. They were very young children who were perhaps orphans. Uh, old women who were either widowed or perhaps their husbands had turned to drink and couldn't work. Well, they were really the people who were on the verge of, of destitution. They had no choice. They were forced to come onto the foreshore uh, to try and find any tiny scrap that they could sell on. Is this the kind of thing that people would have been looking for? That's exactly the sort of thing people would look for. Um, any old bits of coal, bits of wood, bits of metal, particularly copper. Copper was a particularly prized metal. And things like rags and bones and old bits of rope. Well, they can't have made much money. Well, they certainly didn't. Um, they would be lucky if they made maybe a penny or two pennies a, a day from what they could pick up. So these were people who were pretty much destitute. Would they work long hours? They could only work at low tide, so that was only for about an hour and a half every day. So not only were they working in the most stinking place and making no money, but 
They didn't even have decent hours to, to make a bit more. That's right. You may think that these scavenging jobs, cigar end collecting, mud larking, bone picking, were the worst. And sure, they were terrible, but they weren't the poorest. Below them were the very worst jobs, because the really destitute ended up here, in the workhouse. There were workhouses before the Victorian period, but the Victorians took them a stage further. The new poor laws of 1834 made them even nastier than they had been. The whole point about the workhouse was that the jobs you did there had to be worse than anything outside. Even so, in the 1850s, there were 200,000 people in workhouses all over the country. For these people, this was about as low as you could go. Once in, it was very difficult to get out. Men were separated from women, the able-bodied from those less fit. And all the jobs were intended to punish you for being poor. So the first job is what? First job is stone breaking. That's Pretty like nasty. The archetypal punishment job, isn't it? It really is, yes. Uh, I can't imagine that they would have had these in they the workhouse. They wouldn't have had those at the time, no. So, what do I have to do? Just hit the stone? You've got to hit that and you've yeah. got to break it into really, really small pieces because the stone would have been used for mending roads. Right. Well, it didn't do anything really, did it? Just no. smoked. No, keep going. <laughs> would everybody have had to do this job? No, not everybody. It was such an awful job. Bang! Well done. Yes. <laughs> the, only the casuals and tramps were, were given that. Oh, I can understand that. They wouldn't want it to stay very long, would they? No. Oh. They would have done this for a day. A day? Yep, yeah, just for one day's work. And it what would they get for return. having done it? Well, they'd get uh, a bed for the night yeah. and a meal. <sighs> Whew. Are they small enough? You need to get them all about this size. Why is that? Because you've got to pass them through a mesh in the wall, a metal mesh in the wall of the stone breaking cell. Why is that? They've got to be small enough to be able to use in road building. And if they didn't, if you couldn't get them through the mesh, then you had to break it again. So I've got to get all this lot that size? Yeah. Right. Ooh. I think I've got the hang of this now. What's next? Next is oakum picking. Over here. What's oakum, Des, and how do you pick it? Well, to start with, you've got a bit of rope or cable that you then have to break up right the way down. This is a piece of rope, and you're breaking it down into the strands. Yeah. And then having got the strand, you break it right down into the yarn. And then you've got to break that yarn down into the actual fibres of the hemp. And so this, what's the oakum? This, the oakum is the raw fibre. It's sort of the unmaking of the old rope. And what's the point of it? What happens well, to this? Because then it goes back to the shipyards and to the, the, the vessels where it's rolled together to form a thin sausage that is then banged into the, the joints in the, in, the, in the planking to stop it leaking. Who are the people who did this? Well, able-bodied inmates in the workhouse that have been uh, given this job to do, but their fingers just used to bleed at the end of a couple of hours of doing this. When you first start doing this, it seems pretty easy. It's uh, money for old rope. But the more that you have to get your fingers into these tiny, clagged-up little threads, the harder it gets, and it, it just it cuts in to your fingers and and your thumbs, and a bit like that, which looks like you could do in no time at all. By the time you've pulled it out into its constituent parts, there's just loads and loads and loads of it, and if you'd have been having to produce pounds of this stuff a day, you'd have had to be going for hour after hour. I suppose the thing about this job is that if you were in a workhouse, you had to do it. Yes, you did, yes. You had to do whatever jobs they gave you. You had no choice in the matter. So, in a way, However awful some of the other jobs were, at least it was your choice. But here they took away your dignity. They did indeed, yeah. And some of the jobs that they had to do were so bad, like this. This was given to workhouse inmates to do, but they didn't necessarily give it to prisoners in countries' jails to do. You're not picking very fast. <laughs> I was thinking. <laughs> <It's> just... <laughs> no room for thinking. 
You don't come to the workhouse to think, you come to the workhouse to work. Yes. Yeah. Don't try this at home. What I'm actually doing is collecting the raw materials for what's probably the worst job I'll ever have to do. This isn't just the worst job of the Victorian era, this must be the worst job of all time. Oh. Wow. Horses were a key part of Victorian life for carriages, for heavy lifting, for travelling, for work, for pleasure, you name it. But wherever you've got horses, you've got lots of bits and pieces. Bags, saddles, stirrups, and they've all got one thing in common. Leather. The problem with leather is that it took a long time to make and was a messy process. Beautiful polished leather like this used on these horses took 15 months work by a whole factory worth of people working in pretty grim conditions. So far I've tried cleaning out steam engines, that was pretty disgusting. Wow. The job of the navvy was hard, dangerous work. Come off the duckboard. Oops. And the scavenging jobs really were horrible, though at least they kept you out of the workhouse. But there's one worse job that's head and shoulders worse than any other job in Victorian times. A job so bad that if you wanted to do it, you had to live and work apart from everyone else in the village. The job of being a tanner. And I don't mean working in a beauty salon. If scraping the raw flesh off dead animals, then soaking them in pools of water and dog feces appeals, then this is the job for you. Every little town in Victorian Britain had its own tannery. Leather was an enormously important part of everyday life. This tannery is the last in the country to make leather in the same way as the Victorians. First, you need a dead cow. To turn it into tooled leather, the work is heavy and smelly. Really smelly. What do we call this place? This is the lime yard. And what happens here? Well, this is the first process. Once the hides have come into us, we uh, are dehairing the hides here. Yeah. So what we've done is we've mixed up water and hydrated lime. Um, and that lime is going to loosen the, the hair by the roots and also it'll swell the fat on the inside so that it's easy to cut off. So when they've been in there a fortnight, we'd pull them out um, and they're ready for dehairing and fleshing. How do I get it out? Hey, pick up the crook there. Yeah. And if you put it right into the far, right into the belly part of the hide, which is as far as you can go, that's about right. Yeah. All right, right. Yes. It's a bit of a smell, isn't it? <laughs> cool. It's like gone off gravy. Possibly. <laughs> but you'll get used to it. Cool. It's heavy too, isn't it? It is heavy. So what do we do now, Andrew? Well, this has got to go up over the beam now. So we've got to get this onto, onto that. That's right. It's a nice, big, heavy hide. It's, it's pretty uh, heavy. How much does it weigh? It's 100 kilos. Listen, you've got plastic gloves on. And, and tights. I haven't. That's all right, won't do you any harm. <laughs> Oh, it's all skidding under my fingers. Yeah, you get that corner there, yeah. Roger. You pull it up. Oh, no, it's all bits of hair coming away in your hands all the time. OK. Right. So now we have to get the hair off? Yes, now you have to work it down with a de-hairing tool. It's all yours. Thank you. Oh, it comes away lovely, doesn't it? Not too bad at all, is it? You know, I think I'm even getting used to the smell now. You will get used to it after a while. Do you even notice it? I don't, but my wife do when I get home night times. <laughs> I'm not surprised, mate. I'm surprised she's still there. <laughs> How many of these would they have been doing a day, Andrew? Well, it depends. A good man would do 15 to 20. So this was pretty heavy work, wasn't it? Yes, I mean, this is the heaviest work that there was in the lime yard. It was always the least popular job, lime yard work. Funny that. <laughs> <laughs> How's that looking, Andrew? Now, let's have a look, see how you're getting on. Yep, you've 
We're leaving a few short hairs here. You've got to get these, all these hairs out, as I say, because once um, it goes into the tan yard, the hair won't come out. This was a bit gross, but the swollen, fatty bit on the inside took us into a whole new league. And I'm talking Premier, not yep. Nationwide Conference. Uh, you want to keep the, the blade That's flat yeah. to the height, because it's on an angle anyway. The blade gets clogged up with the fat, doesn't it? Yeah. You just keep, keep clearing it off all the time. It's very sharp, mine, so yeah. watch your fingers. Ugh. OK. All right. Let's have. Oh, you're welcome. It's hard to keep the blade in your hands because it's so wet and sticky mm. down here that yeah. it keeps trying to run away from you, doesn't it? Poor. Oh. The old smell's coming <laughs> up again there, isn't it? Dear, oh dear. Oh, it's this fatty bit that's so horrible. Your arms are stink after this. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God! Oh, no! Poor, yeah, take over for a bit <laughs> while I go and die in a corner. Whew. But so far, we haven't seen any dog poo, have we? You haven't yet, no. What happens is <clears throat> when the hide's been cleaned up, so it's um, been fleshed and dehaired, it's then ready for de-liming or baiting, as they used to say in the old days. Now, the baiting was a mixture of dog dung and chicken dung in a pit with water and then warmed up. And you used to get the bacteria from the, the dung, you used to work on the hide or the fibres of the hide and soften it. And the idea was um, you only had to put it in for a short time, but the old boys used to keep it for weeks because the older it was, the more bacteria that was in there. So you'd get this smell, which is pretty difficult to work in, and then, in addition to that, there'd be this kind of chicken and dog poo gravy that they heated up. Yes. Um, well, particularly in um, thundery weather, it used to work on its own, um, particularly if you kept it for any length of time, and then the whole village used to smell it. <laughs> She's a long-suffering woman, your she wife. She must be, that's right. I've done some fairly foul jobs during the course of this series. I've eaten toads, I've been up to my knees in stale urine, I've been on the receiving end of explosions. But simply in terms of back-breaking work, of cold water, of the rotting flesh and the sheer unmitigated stink, I have to say that uh, being a tanner has got some claim to being the worst job of all. History. We tend to think of places like this and the kings and the queens and the great discoveries and the big battles. But without the tanner and the fuller and the men who looked after the knights and kept their armour shining and the lob lolly boys and the salt peter men and the grooms of the stool, none of this would have happened. We owe them a lot. The people who did some of the worst jobs in history shaped the world in which we live. <laughs>